to start on time. We want to respect your time. Uh, and so we're going to get started and, uh, and, and, and get into the meat of this. So tonight we are here prior to finalizing our 2020 proposed budget. Uh, what I have said to so many of you over and over again is transparency is so important to our administration uh, as well as regular communication. And, uh, and I've said it uh, before and I will say it again tonight, it is impossible to represent people you don't know or understand. And so you'll find that we'll do a number of these regular uh, community events, including this budget meeting, uh, so that we have an opportunity to hear from you and to hear some of the things that are important. Um, our 2020 proposed budget uh, is not done yet, uh, and we've been meeting with all of our county agencies and hearing feedback from them, reviewing their agencies and their needs. Um, but we can't submit anything to the county council until we hear from you, and so that is what tonight's meeting is about. Uh, there are a number of people who I should thank. We have a good number of our cabinet members here. I know that uh, Major Riddick is somewhere in the House. He's our Chief Administrative Officer. Where are you, Major Riddick? For those who know Major, he is a man of great energy, so I'm sure he's somewhere doing um, some work. We also have uh, many of our Deputy Chief Administrative Officers and other cabinet level uh, officials, as well as other folks who are working in county government, and I want to thank all of them. I see our Chief of Police, Chief Stawinski, uh, who is here. Uh, I want to thank him for being here, Gloria Barnett, and I'll get in trouble, our Fire Chief, if I start going down, but I'm so pleased to see everyone. What you should know about our budget is that this budget reflects our priorities. And the good news is that I have had an opportunity to hear from uh, so many in our community, and so I am clear about the things that matter to this community. And we were really diligent in making sure that this budget reflects the priorities uh, of this community. Uh, beginning with education, it is never, ever, uh, it goes without saying, it is, it is really never a question as to whether or not we will fund education. And in fact, this year, as we've done in many years prior, we have exceeded maintenance of effort, uh, the requirement, the state requirement that we have for education, and, uh, and we have done so uh, several million dollars above maintenance of effort. Uh, this this uh, constitutes about 60% of our budget, of the entire budget for Prince George's County goes to education, uh, followed by about 22% of our budget goes to public safety. And so we spend, uh, on average, about 82% of the entire budget for Prince George's County goes to education and public safety. We believe that this is appropriate, uh, and we have done this again this year. Uh, in terms of public safety, and I am not just saying it here uh, because our chief and Mary Lou McDonough and uh, uh, our sheriff may be somewhere around as well, but they have done such an excellent job uh, in public safety that it has really been our intention to make sure that in our budget, uh, we were not able this year to go over much over what we usually fund, but we wanted to make sure that we at least sustain the funding for, uh, for all of those agencies uh, and to make sure that we're able to continue to see the progress that we've seen in public safety. And I, I want to thank all of them uh, for the fantastic work uh, that has been done in public safety. Uh, our reputation, I tell you, grows by the day, and it is in large part uh, because we are able to say that it is safe to be in Prince George's County. So I want to thank them so much uh, for the work that they do. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we talked about education. And I have to tell you, I was in Annapolis today. Uh, and even though we have exceeded maintenance of effort, we haven't stopped there. Uh, I was there. And, as, and for those of you who saw me in Annapolis today, I was a little bit upset. Uh, in fact, I received a text message from my dad. He calls me little fella. And he said, well, I hope you have calmed down by now, little fella. I got to see you on the news today. Uh, and what I was talking about, as you all heard, unfortunately, that there was a very derogatory comment made about Prince Georgians. Uh, and the question posed to me was, what do you think about this? And, uh, and I could say uh, to the people who were asking me about it, I don't think very much of it at all. I know who we are as Prince Georgians uh, and that we would not yield to ignorance or yield to people who are unenlightened uh, but that we would instead spend more time talking about equity than we would outrage, uh, and that it is important to us. And I know Prince Georgians, we want equity here and want to make sure that we honor the most sacred obligation that we have as government, and that is the education of our children. That is the absolute most sacred, that is the most sacred obligation we have, uh, is to educate our children and to do so in a first-class manner. 
Uh, so school construction has been extremely important uh, as will be operational funding as well. And so we have been, ever since the first day of session, we have been on fire in Annapolis ensuring that we bring back every single dollar that we are entitled to, and we mean this. We want every single dollar uh, that our kids are entitled to. And so uh, today I was really pleased to join Senator Peters. We had also uh, Dr. Monica Golson from our school system join us. Stanley Early came also, who is our budget director, uh, for us to testify in front of the Budget and Taxation Committee. And, uh, and I tell you, you know, it's not done yet, and we have a large hill to climb, but we have a backlog of $8 billion in school-related um, uh, work that needs to be done. Uh, we have buildings that we need to build, we, and we are just really, really far behind. And so we have been very aggressive in our request to the state. And in fact, we were almost so arrogant that we went there and requested nearly a billion dollars in additional school construction funding to come to Prince George's County uh, over the next 20 years. And if we get our way, and I'm going to tell you, we haven't been polite about it. We've been elbowing and shoving and everything else in Annapolis. And, uh, and if we get our way, what we believe will happen is that we will get an additional up to $30 million per year above what the state would usually give us in school funding, construction funding, uh, that would allow us to build 18 new schools in the next seven years. Uh, and it, we're not going to stop there. Uh, they told us that this year, in terms of Kerwin, uh, and you all have probably heard of the Kerwin Commission. It talks about the school formula that will talk about operational funding, how we pay our teachers, which is important to us, how we control class size, the amount of money that we will have to spend for our at-risk student population, for students who suffer with disabilities. All of that funding uh, will come to us through something called the Kerwin Commission. And we are understanding that Prince George's County will be due a large share of those dollars. Uh, this year, they are not focusing so much on Kerwin as they will next year, but they are planning to, uh, to give a little bit of a down payment, if you will, on Kerwin that will involve pre-K funding uh, and will also involve funding for students with disabilities uh, as well as some, some money for teachers' pay. So that's what we're looking at for, uh, for Kerwin dollars this year. Uh, but in addition to education and public safety, uh, which again are always our priorities, we understand that there are so many other needs that we have in our county. Uh, as I mentioned to you, anytime you spend 82% of the budget on education and public safety, uh, what it means is that we've had to make some tough choices over the years. And, uh, and it also means that in many cases we have underinvested in some areas that have been very important to us, including beautification. Uh, I cannot tell you how many people I pass in the Wegmans who pull me over when I'm in there nearly every day getting my salad and, uh, and balance that off with a uh, muffin. This is not right, right? But, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but when I'm in the, in the Wegmans who talk about, you know, they want their neighborhoods to be beautiful. Um, and so we have had to make some choices in this budget to uh, around beautification and addressing some of the issues that we heard a lot from our constituents about, including bulky trash collection, which has uh, really been in need of some help. We, we learned that part of the issue around bulky trash collection was that we had vehicles that were in such disrepair that we spent all last year and those vehicles were broken, quite honestly. We were not able to get out and to provide the level of service that our citizens deserve because we had vehicles that were in disrepair. So we have made a substantial investment this year in, uh, in vehicles to make sure that we are able to get out into our communities and collect the bulky trash, as you should expect from us. Uh, we've also made a major investment in code enforcement uh, through our Department of Permitting and Inspections uh, to make sure that, that, uh, that our neighborhoods are beautiful uh, and that we are not turning a blind eye to many of the code infractions that we hear our residents talk so often about. Uh, what we learned through our agency reviews is that some of those issues came about as a result of understaffing, inadequate staffing, uh, and also that we had a real challenge around technology or the lack thereof in many of our agencies. And if I'm uh, blunt about it, and, and maybe this isn't something I should say, but it's true, uh, we had one of our newer directors who came and said, oh my goodness, uh, it looks to me like some of our operations reflect 1985. 1985, that we were grossly understaffed and that the technology just was not uh, of a level that would allow us to deliver the services that were necessary. So it meant we had to make tough choices in this budget uh, to improve technology in the department, uh, in the Office of Central Services. We've heard from businesses who want to feel that they have a fair shot uh, at, at 
uh, really applying for some of the opportunities, business opportunities uh, and contracting opportunities, but we were able, so we made a really substantial investment as well in e-procurement to make sure that we could do all of that, we would digitize much of what we've been doing with paper, that it is now allowing us in a more transparent way to, to receive uh, new bids and contracts, and that people can apply uh, online and, and get responses. And so we made that, techno that uh, investment in technology. And we're also making uh, investments that we believe will aid us in economic development. Uh, and this is very important to us. It is uh, through the Department of Permitting and Inspections. It's also through the Office of Central Services. But we want to be able to be competitive for companies like Amazon. Uh, you all know that they're in Fairfax. They pulled out of New York, and we contacted them right away and said, we think we have a great second site for you uh, in a place where you would love to be. But it meant that when we attract those businesses, we have to be ready to receive the business. And having our technology up to date and also having adequate staffing and making sure that our agencies are running properly would be is, is the way to attract the Amazons and the Cheesecake Factories and all of the other things that we want, the high-end restaurants that we want and deserve to come to Prince George's County. Uh, in addition to that, I heard you talk about transportation, that it is not just important to be able to get out of Prince George's County. We have those beautiful 15 metro stations, but it's important to be able to get around inside Prince George's County as well. Uh, this was a major problem for us, so we twisted Stanley Early's arm, and I have to tell you, we got the right guy over the budget, the right guy over the money. You know, we, we have, uh, who has just been a really wonderful steward of our dollars, which is why we have a triple A bond rating in Prince George's County. Uh, but Stanley, it hurts him. It looks like it almost, he almost has a physical reaction to giving up uh, additional dollars uh, because he wants to make sure that we uh, stay in the right place, but we were able to get $8 million for new buses. Uh, uh, to be able to transport our citizens uh, more safely and conveniently around Prince George's County. Um, also, the Office of Human Resource Management. Uh, I'm really proud of, of the investments we're making there. We're going to place a very heavy emphasis. You heard me say this, uh, and if, if you, somebody's going to raise a hand and say, yes, I did hear you say that, that we would not only invest in economic development, but I told you that we would invest in what? Human development as well. And so we have made an investment through the Office of Human Resource Management. I uh, discussed with Sean Stokes here that I wanted us to really invest in our workforce. And not just the workforce that we're hoping to attract, but we have a workforce that comes to work for Prince George's County every day that deserves an investment in training, that we care about their development as people and as professionals. And so we are making a renewed investment uh, there to make sure that we are able to build a workforce and that we're, so we're putting a half million dollars uh, in technology in the Office of Human Resource Management uh, because I understood through Sean Stokes that we were there with triplicate forms to, um, to be able to review our employees, meaning you get your copy, I get a copy, and I put the other copy in a file. Well, as it turns out, that's not how people do business anymore, okay, <laughs> with the paper. So we needed more technology there as well. So we're making a really uh, substantial investment uh, in, in human resource management. But one of the major investments we made, uh, and I'm so proud of this, is in our summer youth enrichment program. Uh, this summer we are, we, we decided to be very aggressive. I think this might have been one of the places where we gave uh, Stanley and Janice and the rest of the team some heartburn, uh, but we doubled our enrollment where we usually accept 3,000 students into our summer jobs program. We went directly to 6,000 young people this summer, and this is uh, something that I'm very proud of. Uh, not only have we extended the number of people that we accept, but we've also ex expanded the age. Now 14 to 22 year olds can apply for summer work in our county. Uh, the kids are excited about it, it's, it was, and it's made me very excited. We've uh, gone out on site uh, to actually help people apply for jobs. We had a couple of the young men come. I thought this was the cutest thing in the world. One guy came and I looked at him and said, I want you to know how sharp you look. He had a tie on, he had taken the time to wear a very neat vest and he had a tie. And I said, oh my gosh, look at you, you look fantastic. And he pointed across the room and said, that young man helped me tie it. So another young man who was there applying for a job uh, helped him to, apply, to, to tie his tie. But that's the kind of pride it instills. Our kids want to succeed. They want to succeed and we're gonna help them uh, to do that. And so uh, we also made a uh, $6 million investment there and we're gonna continue to make investments. So, you are not here tonight to hear from me, as it turns out. We're here to hear from you. 
Uh, so I will not go on and on and on, but I do want to thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you for what you're doing uh, to continue to build the pride that we feel in Prince George's County. Uh, as I said to you today, when I had to go out there and, and address this issue regarding how someone referred to us, the truth of the matter is I'm 100% confident in who we are. And anybody who spends three minutes in Prince George's County will walk away feeling the same way that I feel about you and about our families and about our future. The future is very bright, Prince George's. That's what I have to tell you. Uh, and that we have top-notch individuals who are managing uh, the resources of our county, uh, that we take these resources very seriously and our obligation to them and to you very seriously. And it really is a great honor uh, to have an opportunity to discuss this budget with you and to hear from you. Uh, you've heard some of the priorities we have, but we want to know the things that are of importance to you. If there's something we missed, we want to hear uh, from you tonight. So I'm going to turn uh, this program over now to Janice Marcellus, uh, and she's going to take us from here and, uh, and, and have a discussion with you. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming out tonight. Thank you. Before I call the first speaker, I'd like to give, uh, go over the rules for tonight's proceedings. First, I'd like to ask everyone to put their cell phones on vibrate during tonight's hearing. In order to provide everyone the opportunity to present testimony this evening, a time limit of three minutes will be imposed. I will have a timer set for three minutes. When there's 30 seconds left, I will hold up a sign reflecting 30 seconds. Once the timer has expired, an alarm will sound. Please be considerate of others and wrap up your comments at that time. Thank you, and our first speaker will be Donna Najaki, and the second speaker, you can come on up, will be Michelle Clark. Hi, good evening. We're here as a group, the three of us. Is it possible that we could um, be able to stay as a group? Good evening, County Executive Alsa Brooks and members of the County Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Andrea Thomas and I'm a co-chair of the Adults with Developmental Disabilities Citizens Advisory Committee, a volunteer advisory committee created by the Maryland Legislature. Our group works for positive systems change in programs and services for adults with developmental disabilities. We are here today asking that you, one, create an office of disability initiatives with a direct report to the county executive, transferring all disability functions from the Department of Family Services, and two, the development of a disability improvement roadmap document with measurable goals, milestones, and an action plan. We believe that disability services are not sufficiently staffed in the Department of Family Services, and there is not an adequate degree of accountability, transparency, and connection to the disability community. We ask these things because of the following. The new regional hospital is under construction not far from here, yet the county has made no commitment to assure that the needs of people with developmental and other di disabilities will be addressed at the new hospital. Two, in July 2017, the County Department of Housing was sued on the basis of disability discrimination and subsequently entered into a settlement agreement in December 2018. Three, the Family Services Department created an internship program for people with disabilities late last year, but did no outreach to the residents of this county with disabilities. We also were alarmed to learn the pro that the program excludes large groups of residents with disabilities from even applying for the internship. This is in direct opposition to Maryland State Developmental Disabilities Administration guidance. Four, despite our repeated efforts to work with Prince George's Community College to establish a viable program serving adults with developmental disabilities, we have been met with staff and managers who appear empowered to exclude people with developmental and other disabilities. We know that the actions highlighted 
highlighted today occurred in the previous administration, but our concern is that there are people in the county government that simply do not want change when it comes to people with disabilities. Michelle Clark, and after Michelle be Monica Montgomery. Montgomery. I'm short here. Good evening, everybody. I'm Michelle Clark, and I am a three-year-old special education teacher at Kim Moore Early Childhood Center. I'm also a member of the board of directors of PGCEA, the Prince George's County Educators Association. Evening. And I'm here today because, of course, the education budget. And the fact of the matter is, I did a bunch of research last year, and I wish I could find that paper with all my, my information. Since 2008 and 2009, when we began to lose steps, there has been some attempt over time to recompensate the firefighters, the police officers, and the county employees. Those of us who work for, the, for PGCPS are the only ones that nobody has tried to make whole. I'm currently four steps behind. That's 12%. And by the way, in the other units, that's a 3.5% increase per step. Ours is 3%, so it's even less. I almost lost my house last year going through foreclosure, something that would have never happened had I gotten my steps when I was supposed to and not been put into that financial situation. I was in Chapter 13 bankruptcy for a number of months until my mother, it wasn't me who came up with the money, my mother got an inheritance for my grandparents. And that's what she used to pay off my debt to my mortgage company. This hurts your county employees in the school system. It really does. We've lost many people. But the worst part of being four steps behind is the fact that somebody who leaves for a year and comes back is placed on their right step. So as a friend of mine who's also going to speak tonight says, it's a loyalty penalty. We were loyal to this school system in this county. And I moved to this county just to be close to work. And instead of being rewarded for that, we've been penalized. People coming into the county come in at their correct step. People who leave and come back get to be on their right step. The damage that's been done to our retirement accounts over the years is something I know you can never make up because I don't even want to try and calculate how much money was lost that way but I just turned 50 last year, so I started to think about it. And if we continue getting steps at the same rate we have over the last 15 years of my career, I will never reach step 20. I would retire at 60 on step 19. And that would be after 25 years in the county. Please make this right. I want to thank you for, um, for sharing that with us tonight. I didn't know, I wanted to address the uh, individuals who were, were ahead of you as well. Uh, but one of the things that I can share with you is this year we're pretty much well into our budget, but going forward next year, one of the things we really anticipate is that there will, in the, for the first time, really be some movement uh, from the Kerwin Commission that will bring to us additional dollars and I can tell you that that Kerwin Commission, which has a, a good number of Prince Georgians on it, uh, part of the focus is for teacher salaries uh, and increases. And so we are going to fight as hard as we can. Um, I'm so sorry to hear um, about the foreclosure and the other hardships that you've endured. And quite frankly, I know that you're not alone, uh, that there are many, many tough choices made by educators that should never have to be made. Um, and I want you to know that I am aware of it and that I you know, will fight really hard uh, to make sure that we get every dollar that we're entitled to 
um, so that we can make whole our teachers, so that we can treat the teaching profession uh, with the respect and dignity that it deserves, the professionals who come before our kids every day. Um, and so this is an area that we're going to work on this year. Um, I'm not sure yet how many uh, additional dollars we will get, but there will be additional funding. Uh, as they've said, Con is a down payment to occur when I have no idea yet uh, whether that will actually materialize and how much it will be, but you should know that all of this is kind of at work uh, and that teachers are really at the top of the chain in terms of how those Kerwin dollars should be used. So thank you so much again, and uh, I'll look forward to working with you and PGCEA and the school system to make sure our teachers are treated with the respect and dignity and that they are paid uh, like the first class professionals that they are. Um, I also want to say to the individuals, I don't know if they're still here, who came from the uh, disabilities community, thank you so much for being here as well. Uh, I know I had an opportunity to come out and to hear firsthand from parents uh, who have children who have developmental disabilities. I can tell you that I was very affected by our meeting and I've shared with our team that this is a priority for me. Uh, give us a little time. I don't know how many days it's been for me, 80 something days I've been on the job. Um, but I assure you that I have not forgotten you and that I will do my best. Um, again, we, uh, I give Stanley quite a bit of a heartburn because I have more desires than we have money. Um, but we're going to do our best to be responsible, but also to be responsive to the needs we have, and most especially um, to members of our community who have developmental disabilities. So thank you. Our next speaker will be Monica Montgomery, and after that will be Chanel Compton. So Monica couldn't be here tonight. I'm uh, Sinatra Smith and I'll be here on her behalf for the Prince George's African American Museum. All right, my name is Dr. Smith and I currently serve as the education curator at the Prince George's African American Museum and Cultural Center. I graduated from Florida International University with a PhD in Global and Sociocultural Studies and a focus on anthropology. I came to the museum in April of 2016 as a volunteer to learn about what it would be like to work at the museum and fell in love with the work this organization was doing around African American art history and culture. By September of that year, I was hired as the education coordinator and scholar in residence. The following October, I was promoted to education curator and now I'm running the entire education department. The model of the museum is that we are a home for black excellence. We tell stories about the black past, present, and future as they relate to our contributions to activism and social justice right here in Prince George's County. I'm here today because we've been historically supported by the county council and we continue to support in order to do the important work that we do and serve all districts in the county. For example, Suitland's population is 90% black, yet only 10% of the population has at least a bachelor's degree. In 2014, our past education director, Chanel Compton, if she's here tonight, um, had the amazing opportunity in, for District 7 culture keepers at Suitland High School to participate in an exchange with the Afro Museo in Brazil. Annapolis Road Academy in District 4 invited us to host a Culture Keepers mini session with their students to bring their black and Latino student populations together. And as you all know, this school works exclusively with students who have issues with attendance and behavior. Moving on to Fairmont Heights in District 5, this town was once a hub for black professionals and black business owners, and now less than 9% of their resident, residents living there hold at least a bachelor's degree. This year, we're launching an arts entrepreneurship series at Fairmont Heights High School to educate students about having a career in the arts through fashion. We'll also be selling the items they design in our brand new museum gift shop and giving 30% of the proceeds to the school's art department. So as you can see, through the Culture Keepers After School program, students from all over the county are able to become ambassadors not only for black history, art, and culture, but also for the county as a whole. Through cultural education, they're able to develop the skills to develop, to advocate for themselves and efficiently mold and shape the direction of the culture in the future. At this political moment, there has been a decrease in funding to arts and cultural institutions, just like our museum, yet we've expanded our capacity through offering grade level early keepers assemblies to our friends in pre-K to second grade. Museum in a Box brings our museum to the classroom so that schools don't have to coordinate a field trip. And we have expanded our culture keepers and history keepers after school programming from three sites to nine sites. We're also very proud of our innovative exhibitions and local artists for all to enjoy. Um, our brand new gift shop features items from county artists and artisans, including many who have been exhibited in our gallery and our new visionary executive director, Monica Montgomery, truly believes in the community aspect of our museum and made sure to further our mission on these aspects and many others. On behalf of the staff, supporters, and family of the Prince George's African American Museum and Cultural Center, we ask for you all to continue to support our home for black excellence. Thank you for your time.
Thank you so much, uh, Monica, for that. That is a beautiful museum. I was just there last week to celebrate uh, Black History Month. It is absolutely beautiful and amazing what you do. I want to welcome Councilwoman Jolene Ivey. I did not see her. I want to acknowledge her and thank her uh, for her presence tonight. Um, as you know, uh, I can say I'm a lover of art, but, uh, but Councilwoman Ivy has a son who has actually performed on Broadway, so you can be assured that, uh, that the arts are loved and respected. Uh, we, of course, intend to, uh, to continue to fully support the African American Museum. Uh, one of the things I want to mention, and Diana Leon Brown is here tonight, and, uh, and one of the things that, that's going to be very important to us is to continue to also attract private investment. Um, to make sure that we're supporting the arts and culture in our county. Uh, the truth of it is the government can't do it all. Uh, we're going to continue to support uh, at the highest levels possible, but we're going to have to really continue to stretch. Sonia Wellborn is here as well. We have a, a wonderful uh, duo in our office, uh, and they are in stakeholder engagement, and, uh, and their mission is to go out. They spend each day developing partnerships for us, and really one of the things I think we need, especially for that African American Art Museum, is we're going to have to continue to try to attract investment uh, to make sure that it's not just the government that's supporting the wonderful work that happens there, but that we also do the work of attracting additional investment. But thank you so much uh, for your passion and for sharing with us tonight. And I just have some papers that Monica asked for me to give to you all. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Chanel Compton, and after that will be Shanisa DeBerry. Chanel. Shanisa DeBerry. Shanisa DeBerry. Thomas Duke. And after Thomas, there will be Curtis and a Benetta. Good evening, Your Honor. Uh, I want you to prioritize prevention and hope for our children and shift from your former job, which was the problem after the fact, and the police department's problem after the fact. We all know investment in prevention is the best dollar of invention, of investment. So my name is Tom Duke, and I'm a homeowner in Prince George's County. I grew up and attended Prince George's County Public Schools in Camp Springs. I've been an ESAW teacher in Prince George's County School classroom since 2007. As a former prosecutor, you had to represent one victim and a family in a scared community seeking justice. Today, you have 130,000 students, their families, and 9,500 classroom teachers. The sense of urgency you had as a prosecutor to get it done in, in, in one year and to um, get one bite of the apple is the same urgency you should have with our students. They only have one bite of the apple. They only have one education in this county. The, uh, this school budget that you received is a first draft, and I applaud first draft efforts by first year people uh, learning their job. This is a trickle down to the students' teachers and teachers' classroom budget. This is a trickle down to the students' and teachers' classroom budget. This is a middleman and middlewoman budget with all kinds of money going to non-school-based personnel. As a matter of fact, this county has 309 more non-school-based personnel than Montgomery County, and Montgomery County has 28,000 more students. Put 10 times more than 2% directly into our students' learning in classrooms and our teachers working in those classrooms. This trickle-down budget continues Prince George's County's classroom teacher loyalty penalty for the four lost steps the teachers earned but were not paid between 2009, 10, and 11. Our loyalty and devotion to our students and parents deserve more than a delay, discourage, and deny bureaucratic task force and reports. We need your urgency, the same urgency you had as a prosecutor. This trickle-down budget continues the two-shift classroom teacher burnout problem. Over 40% of teachers have second jobs. Our students and parents deserve full-time, one-shift teachers, not teachers and Uber drivers. This budget continues the understaffing teacher burnout problem that affects classroom teacher retention and classroom teacher recruitment. We parents, students, and teachers here support all the time. The printed word support is in, 300, in the 307-page uh, Board of Education budget on 147 pages. Bad news. Quote, classroom support, close quote, is on zero pages out of the 307. No results found in this search. No results found on for support teachers. 
No results found for classroom teacher compensation. Where is the urgency? Excuse me. Just as you wouldn't give the fire department a trickle of water, don't give the students a trickle full of water. Support our students and us by lifting the burden of a second shift. Support our students and us by removing the loyalty penalty. Support our students and us by paying us for a single fair professional teacher salary so we can continue to devote ourselves completely to our students in the classroom where we work and our students learn every day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas, and thank you also for your commitment as a teacher. We appreciate you so much. Thank you. Curtis Anna Bennett. Curtis Virginia Jones. And after Virginia will be Robert Malone. Good evening. My name is Virginia Jones. I am a 40-year homeowner and taxpayer in Prince George's County. I graduated from the University of Maryland College Park and from Bowie State University. I'm a retired Prince George's County teacher and I still substitute in the schools. Therefore, I am very invested in this county and care very much about the environment. As an active volunteer and a foster parent for nearly 10 years now, my passion lies with the homeless animals that find themselves through no choice of their own at the County Animal Services Shelter in Upper Marlboro. I wish to make three points in the next two minutes. First, when the temporary positions at the County Animal Shelter were converted to permanent county positions with full benefits, there was a failure to plan and budget for adequate personnel to staff the facility that provides employees paid personal leave, paid sick leave, and paid holidays. Therefore, there's a continual daily shortage of employees to humanely care for the number of animals housed at that shelter. There are formulas that could be employed to compute the number of staff hours required throughout the year, but the budget must include that level of staffing. Second, the cumbersome bureaucratic procedures that human resources must work through to fill vacant positions at the shelter mean that critical positions remain vacant for extremely long periods of time, in several cases more than a year or two. In an environment where living creatures are literally imprisoned, it is mandatory that they receive the utmost constant attention to maintain their health and to minimize stress. When that level of care is not possible to deliver, we the citizens fail our moral and ethical responsibility as human beings. Efficient procedures throughout the human resources that reflect the urgency of caring for live creatures must be executed expeditiously. Third, as a result of these two factors, the existing staff at our animal shelter find themselves under pressure to achieve the impossible. Many of these individuals are, are committed to the welfare of homeless animals, but they are stretched thin. We have not had a kennel manager for two years. We were missing a kennel supervisor for a very long time. We're missing two of the four veterinary technicians, as well as several animal caretakers, a rescue coordinator, and a cashier, without even mentioning animal control officers and other positions. The result is that animals have not received adequate attention, and several became sick to the point of having to be euthanized or saved by my own personal retirement funds. Furthermore, the few supervisors do not have adequate opportunity to rectify this situation by actually supervising and training employees in the detailed responsibilities that go far beyond scooping and mopping. In sum, I urge that we take moral and ethical responsibility for these lives because all lives do matter by budgeting for adequate staffing levels and by expediting the quality staffing at the shelter. Thank you. Thank you. Robert, and then it'll be Jacqueline Beal. Good evening, County Executive Angela Also Brooks. My name is Rob Malone, and I'm here to testify and share comments on behalf of the ARC, Prince George's County in particular. Uh, the ARC is a critical service organization in a network of state providers that provides a lifetime of support to people with disabilities. Um, and we were honored to have you meet with some parents late last year, and you heard their stories and sort of the dynamic of what it's like to have a child with a disability and then to have an adult with a disability. 
and you know it's a very challenging situation and people sometimes need 24-7 care, they need people to support them in medications, they need folks to help them find employment. Uh, this network is critical to having people with disabilities live outside of institutions which they were relegated to years ago and to take advantage of the full community. Uh, our concern, as you know, and I'm really testifying for our community to hear this as well, it was generated as an unintended consequence of the raise in minimum wage for Prince George's County ahead of the state, which basically called the funding imbalance. So if the county minimum wage is higher than the state minimum wage, the state formula that supplies our rate system uh, creates an imbalance. And so we have um, testified in 2015, we have rallied and marched and protested in 2016, we have testified again in 2017, we have testified in 2018. Uh, unfortunately, the county executive administration did not respond to the full need of disability service providers in Prince George's County. Fortunately, the county council did act and put in a 3.5 million supplement that kind of mirrors what Montgomery County does. But that 3.5 million supplement is just simply not sufficient. So for instance, the ARC Prince George's County, we shared with you, lost $800,000 last fiscal year ending June 30th and simply not, cannot sustain that sort of impact. In fact, we have less liquidity in current assets than we have current liabilities and we have an unrestricted net asset position that's at a negative million dollars. So we don't want to be an embarrassment for the county. We don't want to let families down that have to depend on us for services. We need to be sure we have staff to support these fam families, so we need your support. I know one concern, and I, I've heard this concern, so I'll address it now. I know one concern among many is that you don't want this to become a continued line item that is a burden for the county budget. And uh, our intention is not to do that, so I want to make sure I state that. We need to double that 3.5 million to be able to sustain services. My personal commitment is I will not have my salary increased nor take any bonuses from the Arc Prince George's County until we were receiving less than a million dollars in supplement from the county for, uh, for the Arc. Thank you very much. Jacqueline Beal. And after Jacqueline, it'll be Beatrice Rogers. Good evening, County Executive Alsabrook. My name is Jacqueline Beal, and I am the Senior Manager for Development Outreach for what I believe is a jewel in Prince George's County. It's often referred to as one of the best kept secrets, but we don't want to be a secret. Hope Connections for Cancer Support provides free, and yes, I'm saying free, programs and services to anyone that has been diagnosed with any form of cancer. And I know people cringe when they hear the word cancer, but the reality is, I dare say, that we're all probably in this room one degree away from someone that we know that's been diagnosed with cancer or someone we will know. Some of the programs, thank you, some of the programs and services we provide are mind-body programs, and what I mean by that is things like strength and weight training, um, pink Pilates, yoga. We also provide support groups and educational programs because people get the diagnosis and they hear cancer, but what does that mean? Integrative care is vital, and I'm glad to see as one of your goals, we're investing in our people, and one of those investments is access to preventive health care, but it needs to be integrative as well. Part of the uniqueness about Hope Connections for Cancer Support, one, unless you go to Annapolis to the Wellness House, we're the only place in Prince George's County and probably the Washington metropolitan region like us. We also provide the very same services to uh, family members, friends, and survivors because we believe when someone's diagnosed with cancer, it takes a village of care. And so the very same services are provided. We're in a home-like environment. I invite you to come tour our facility. And also, <laughs> another great thing about it, there's no duration time. Just because you get diagnosed with cancer now, and you may be all well, happy, healthy, living your best life again, something may be triggered and you may need us again, continue to come see us. So we want to thank, first of all, the investment that was made last year with us for young African-American women being diagnosed with breast cancer. 
which we thank the Prince George's County Council. We stood up that program because Doctors Hospital came to us and said they were seeing patients as young in their 20s. But we in Prince George's County are leading some of the statistics in breast, in lung, in colon, and prostate cancer. So we still have gaps. We still have a lot of work to do. We still need your help and we still need your support. I can tell you that, yes, we can invest in education, we can invest in infrastructure, but if we don't invest in the health of our residents, we're not going to be a growing, uh, productive, or prosperous county. Thank you. Beatrice Rogers, and after B, it be Amy Pergoski. Good evening, County Executive Alsa Brooks. It's nice to see you again. Uh, for the record, my name is B. Rogers, and I'm representing the Prince George's Providers Council, which is a collaborative of more than 30 agencies which provide day-to-day -day and services for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Our agencies provided more than $5 million, of, $5 million hours of direct care support last year, and we estimate that the 1,500 direct support staff will probably make 6 million hours this year. Um, they are the backbone of our agency, and without quality, skilled, and committed staff, our agencies will not succeed. We would be remiss if we didn't thank you for your role in supporting the minimum wage legislation, Fight for 55, um, and your strong, strong support in, in testifying. While the bill, as amended in the House, is not what we wanted and is not going to be that helpful to us, we are still working with the House leaders as well as the Senate leaders to try to get it amended so that there will be a restoration of the wage percentage for our community staff equal to what they increased for the other Medicaid community staff. Any assistance you can give us in that area as the bills work their way through, we would most appreciate it. Um, I have packets for your office, so I'm not going to repeat any of the history, um, but we do know, we want to acknowledge that through the County Council, we were able to get $3.5 million, which was split among 32 agencies last year. Uh, Mr. Urino, he worked with us on, on this, as, as did the County Council, in trying to help meet our folks, make sure our folks got a little bit above minimum wage and met all of the county minimum wage requirements. We are therefore respectfully requesting an additional $3 million in the budget. Um, so those are our two asks for you. Um, I've already talked with Dr. Askew tonight and both he and um, Major Riddick over the phone, so they knew something was coming from us tonight. And, any support you can give us would be greatly appreciated. And Janice, I have these packets for you. Amy, and after Amy, there will be James Riley. Good evening. My name is Amy Pergoski. I've been a homeowner in this county for 19 years. I'm a member of the Prince George's County Police Department District 6 and Police Chief CAC. For the past 14 years, I have also volunteered at the County Animal Shelter. I serve in these capacities because I care about the safety in my county and helping those who can't help themselves. Discrimination in Prince George's County is taking a toll on the budget. February 9th marks the 22-year anniversary of the county's discriminatory pit bull ban for breed-specific legislation. As a shelter volunteer, I have interacted with thousands of the county's homeless dogs. For the past few years, I have been approved to help evaluate, evaluate or temperament test and, and walk the pit bulls um, in the shelter. In my 14 years there, I was only bitten once by a dog and it was not by a pit bull. The ban currently in place does not work for the following reasons. It's not reducing the number of pit bulls in the county. On any given day, there are dozens. Last Sunday when I was there, there were 47 dogs labeled as pit bulls or pit bull mixes in our shelter. Over half of the restricted kennel was populated by pit bull or pit bull mixes. The ban is the breed that is banned. Many of the females at the shelter clearly have had puppies at some point, which means that citizens are breeding them despite the ban. The breed identification by shelter staff is arbitrary. Mere visual assessment cannot accurately identify the breed, only DNA can. 
Many dogs labeled as pit bulls or mixes have wonderful temperaments. I, I spend a lot of time with these dogs. If a rescue partner doesn't have room for them, they are put down since they can't be adopted to even the most responsible and qualified pet parents in our county. So how does this affect the budget? The county is spending taxpayer dollars to stockpile a pit bulls, deny them daily exercise due to the inadequate staffing levels, deny them social interaction since they're kept out of the public view, and then sadly put most of them down. This is just unacceptable. So what's the solution? First, the breed-specific ban should be replaced with existing dangerous dog ordinances. Dangerous dogs can be of any breed. As the mom of five amazing PG shelter dogs and a longtime shelter and rescue pet promoter, I would never advocate that an aggressive dog of any breed be placed in a home. Second, enact spay and neuter legislation to stop the backyard breeding. Third, we need a pit bull placement pilot program. I'm not asking that every pit, pit bull be placed um, into the public for adoption. I'm only asking that all dogs with good temperaments, regardless of appearance, be given the chance to find a forever home with responsible, with, with responsible and qualified adopters. The county has a fiscal responsibility to taxpayers to not waste money and a moral obligation to not discriminate. To automatically label anything that looks like a pit bull as illegal and dangerous is pure discrimination. And in the year 2019, aren't we all opposed to discrimination? At the end of the day, it is always better to do the difficult right thing than the easy wrong thing. Condemning all pit bulls in the county for decades is wrong and expensive. Please help me to be proud of my county for doing the right thing. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Let this administration be the one to stop it. Thank you. James, after James, it'll be Lee Paley. Good afternoon, James Riley. Um, I realized that um, being a resident of Prince George's County and looking at the emergency uh, medical services, there's no exit ramp or on ramp coming off of Church Road onto 50. So I reached out to uh, the state way administrator, Gregory Slater, and he stated that this needed to be on your priority list in order to submit for funding to get this uh, uh, taken care of. So this is the letter he, he wrote me. The Maryland Department of Transportation works with Prince George's County to identify improvement priorities for transportation networks, primarily through coordinating with the county on priorities for major projects, such as constructing a new interchange to assist in prioritizing projects. MDOC requests that each year local jurisdictions identify transportation needs, prioritize those needs, prepare a list of transportation priorities, and forward the list to MDOC for review. These local priorities locations are typically derived from the, lo the local master plans, anticipated growth areas, areas where large scale capital improvements would improve traffic operations. The MDOC compiles the local priorities across the state and evaluates them to determine which projects we may be able to program or advance. In conclusion, the priority letter is an important consideration that MDOC uses to determine which projects we consider for funding. Prince George's County has not included a US 50 interchange at Church Road in its priority letter. NDOC encourages you to work with your county representative to prioritize these proposed improvements. Thank you so much. We, we actually met yesterday with Greg Slater and Secretary Ron. Um, they're absolutely right that the county submits each year a letter of transportation priority. We do so. Uh, in concert with the county council um, and so we're glad to have this information we have submitted this year the priorities which include route 210 uh, and a number of other uh, areas but this is one that you know I'm glad to know about and something that we can consider adding uh, in our request going forward thank you after lee it'll be justin robinson Good evening, County Executive Alsa Brooks. My name is Leah Paley. I'm the Executive Director at Laurel Advocacy and Referral Services. I'm here tonight to acknowledge the ongoing financial support from Prince George's County. We're very grateful for the support that we've received in the last year, and it continues to play a critical role in meeting um, the needs of our programs and services, where we provide services to Laurel residents. We, were, we have been around for 32 years. 
We were created as a central point of contact and a source of support for Laurel residents facing eviction, food insecurity, and financial crisis. Our mission is to enable homeless and low-income households in Laurel to achieve stability and financial uh, self-sufficiency. Our goal is to not only alleviate that immediate crisis, but also teach skills and habits that empower people to maintain financial stability and prevent future crises. We strive to remain responsive to the growing and changing needs of our community by digging deeper to address the root causes of financial crisis. By serving as a safety net for individuals and families who are facing food insecurity, eviction, and other challenges, we help build a stable foundation for households to become self-sufficient. An estimated 8% of Laurel residents live below the federal poverty line, and many who live above it are barely breaking even. According to the United Way's Alice Report, a single parent with two children in Prince George's County would need to earn a living wage of $31 in order to meet their family's basic needs. That translates to about $66,000 a year. Um, this is more than three times the federal poverty level of $20,000 for a single parent with two children. Over half of the individuals that come in and receive our services earn less than $2,000 a year, and another 21% have absolutely no income. Uh, for the, in Prince George's County, the fair market rent for a two-bedroom home is 1700 So as you can imagine, more and more people are spending more and more of their monthly income to remain housed. And therefore, because they're unable to do so and remain stable, they're turning to organizations like Lars. Last year, we served 1,700 households for a total of 5,300 visits. We distributed over 8,000 bags of food and assisted households with rental uh, stipends totaling $61,000, we assisted 105 households. 80%, excuse me, 83% of the households that's, that we served are Prince George's County residents. We also operate a federally subsidized housing program for homeless and disabled individuals and families in Prince George's County. And in addition to that, operate a self-sufficiency program which has six motivated individuals, all Prince George's County residents, who are working closely with our case manager on longer term goals such as improving financial habits, gaining employment, and removing other barriers to self-sufficiency. We're requesting $100,000 this year from the, um, from the county, which allows us to maintain our core programs and retain staff who are very knowledgeable about the resources in our community. And I do have copies. Justin, and after Justin, it'd be Courtney St. John. Justin Robinson. Courtney St. John. Courtney. Shirley Walker. Shirley Walker. Darlene Foreman. After Darlene, it'll be Claire Agar, Agar. Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Good evening, County Executive Hasselbrock. My name is Darlene Foreman. I'm a pediatric nurse at Children's Hospital. I've worked there for 40 years. Um, currently, I work at the ambulatory setting in Laurel, um, Maryland, getting ready to build the new, you've probably seen the 50,000 square foot um, new re regional outpatient center in Woodmore um, Crossing. That's going to be our new, our new ambulatory setting. But I'm here tonight representing another division of Children's Hospital, um, Bra Brainy Camps, Brainy Camps of, and Dr. Bear. Um, Children's Hospital, this is the first hospital that has purchased 120 acres on Croom Road. And for the past 23 years, Brainy Camps um, historically has been on different parts of the, in the country. But this is the first time Children's Hospital has purchased this, this property. And so Brainy Camps is a consortium of 11 camps um, with children of chronic health disease, such as high functioning autism, Tourette syndrome, Down syndrome, heart disease, obesity, and just currently this year we're going to be adding celiac patients with celiac disease, cancer, and children that have lost um, a parent. 
So um, we have a lot of work to do. There's This land has been um, vacant for many years. It has an historic um, home on it. It has three barns. So we're partnering with many people in the community, faith-based organizations, um, each child. This year it'll be 200 children that we're trying to send to camp. And in the past, um, we usually get funding for 60%, and we never turn a child away. So we're asking for support for the help and the development of the Brainy Camps for Dr. Bear for Children's Hospital, and then to be able to sponsor these children um, so they can come, so their parents can have respite. Um, it's 24-7 um, um, housed by um, 21 doctors, nurses, psychologists, and volunteers. So we're very excited about partnering with people in the community, the faith-based community. The University of Maryland's Department of Agriculture is coming with their, um, their, um, their students to help us build and to develop this land. So we're very excited about this. And I'm just gonna read one of the campers' testimonies um, from the previous year. She says, next year, Brainy Camps is building their very first own site. I think they should have a climbing wall, and I wanted to ask you to help. Climbing has given me a sense of pride, strength, and accomplishment. I want other kids to feel that way too. So this is an opportunity for children that look just like them to be comfortable and to thrive and to heal in nature as opposed to um, technology and, and, and texting and tablets and things. We just feel the research has proven that putting children out in the out of doors, getting them back to green um, is, is best for their, for their well-being. Thank you. And I do have the package. Claire Agard, and after Claire will be Kimberly Glass. Good evening, County Executive, also Brooks, members of the City Council. My name is Claire Agard. I'm a school psychologist who holds a doctoral degree in neuropsychology. I am currently employed by Prince George's County I'm currently employed by Prince George's County Public Schools Department of Psychological Services, and I'm here to address you on behalf of my entire department. Over my 29 years of employment in my current position, I have seen the mental health needs of students increase exponentially. For this reason, I'm here to draw your attention to the need for an increased number of school psychologists to meet the mental health needs of the students of this county. For years, the school system and county administrators have, have all repeatedly stated that they, quote, care about the children of this county. At one time, the school system's logo even included something about caring for students. With regard to schools, this caring has primarily been expressed in need to raise test scores and increase overall academic performance. Unfortunately, this form of caring, of caring is misguided and at best uninformed. Students cannot be academically successful unless they are emotionally healthy. Sadly, there has never been funding for enough school psychologists to assist students in developing the mental health precursors to optimal academic performance. The National Association of School Psychologists recommends a school psychologist to student ratio of one psychologist to, five, to 500 to 700 students. I am assigned to 2,000 892 students. And the school system's average psychologist to student ratio is one to approximately 1,140 students. In order to try to meet the needs of as many students as possible, many of us work at home on weekends and into the wee hours of the morning. 
writing reports, and engaging in the myriad of tasks that we are unable to accomplish during the workday because inadequate staffing necessitates that a single psychologist provide an unrealistic number of services in a single day. The Board of Education's recent action demonstrated that that body truly cares for students. I urge you to fund the 23 additional school psychology positions that the board has put into the new budget. Yeah, thank you. Kimberly Glass and after Kimberly will be Nicole Jones. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Glass. I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist also employed uh, by PG County um, Public Schools. I'm also uh, a resident and uh, I have a personal and professional stake. I have two children um, as well. Uh, I wanted to thank the board and kind of recognize that they, that they did a beautiful job of listening to what people were saying when they had their own listening um, meetings. I wanted to say that I, I just left private practice last year and joined the uh, Prince George's County uh, uh, education system. And I was, I've been very excited about this work, about being able to reach more children. Um, I've also uh, been very humbled. Um, I came here, maybe been a little bit cocky with my knowledge. Um, and then I've realized that two things. One, as seen behind me and in uh, other sessions for the board, we have an amazing staff, very knowledgeable about a wide range of, of subjects. And the other thing that has been very humbling to me is the workload. I mean, it, is, it has been uh, astounding. Um, school psychologists offer knowledge and support not only about mental health, which we offer a wide range of knowledge about mental health, developmental trauma, which is a particular interest with our focus on socio, uh, social emotional learning um, this year, but also we know about uh, learning disabilities, we know about developmental disabilities, we know about um, education, and we know about the integration and how these things are integrated, not just that we want our kids to be happy and successful, but that being happy and successful are, are being um, resilient allows them uh, to be available to learning. And we know the early signs of dyslexia. We know what girls look like when they have autism, these kind of things. And we have that integration in a way that other staff doesn't. Um, last year, it was all I could do to keep up with the workload. This year, I'm, I'm slightly better, but th there is so much more that I can do. Right now, mostly what I do is assessments. And that's good because it lets us know what the children need and it also keeps us from you know, being sued as a county because we're keeping up with state mandates. But there are so many things. I, I, we had two bullies in my school last year. They were great, great kids. They just didn't know where to put their efforts and there was some home stuff. I wanted to put together a bully program that included peer mediation training and they were gonna compete against each other to, to have the best peer me mediation group. And these kids could have done it. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't help them because I was too busy doing assessments. Um, I, I, like to, I like to mentor teachers about what does early signs of dyslexia look like? What does developmental trauma look like? And how do you handle that differently than a child with just oppositionality? How does that affect learning? And I'm not able to do that because all I'm doing is uh, assessment for the most part. My goal is to be a resource and I'm unable to be the resource that I'm capable of being for these children whom I love and the teachers who I want to plug also are amazing. I've been very impressed with the quality of teachers who just don't have the time and the energy to put into these kids that they love because they're not doing it for the money, <laughs> they're doing it for the time and all of us are, unfortunately, for me to do what I want to do, even just the bare basics, I had to sacrifice my own family needs or more often my sleep needs. Um, and I, I, I beg of you guys to support the teachers and to support us in getting the staffing that we need. Nicole Jones and then Angela Martin will be next. Good evening. My name is Dr. Nicole Jones and I have been a PGCPS school psychologist for the past five and a half years and a resident of PG County for four and a half. Since starting PGCPS, my assignments have always been two schools. Our average rate for PGCPS is one psychologist to 1,450 students. The national recommendation is one psychologist to 500 students. Our rate is triple the national average as well as best practice. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, 20% of our youth ages 13 to 18 live with a mental health condition. 37% of students with a mental, mental health condition age 14 and older drop out of school. 
As school psychologists, we are trained in assessment, school-wide practices to promote learning, resilience and risk factors, consultation and collaboration, mental health interventions, behavioral interventions, and crisis preparedness, response, and recovery. For me specifically, I currently work in a school with 24% special education population, with the district average being 10%. Due to our current ratios, I am only in this school three days a week, with two of those days being spent in meetings. Not only have more students been added to our special education population, but more students with intense needs have been added. Students who require constant behavioral and social emotional interventions. Interventions that I am trained in, but cannot give because of my limited time with them. We have students who scream, hit, bite, kick, and use profanity on a daily basis when the smallest change or inconvenience occurs. Children require one-on-one -on -one assistance on a daily basis to overcome these challenges, assistance that I cannot give because of my limited time. At my second placement, I can only attend for meetings and testing. I cannot provide intervention. I cannot provide face-to-face -face consultation. Due to my schedule, I'm not able to write my reports at school. Therefore, all of my report writing takes place at home during non-work hours. This is having a major impact on not only my professional life, but my personal life. We are overworked, short-staffed, and mentally exhausted. I ask that you please fund the Board of Education submitted budget in full to include seriously inadequate student access to mental and behavioral health supports, such as school psychologists. Thank you. Thank you. Angela Martin. Angela. Alyssa Kaufman, and after Alyssa be Ruthie Mundell. Hello, my name is Alyssa Kaufman, and I am in my six years as school psychologist for, the Prince, George's, for Prince George's County. My assignment includes Benjamin D. Fulwick Creative and Performing Arts Academy, Gwen Park Middle School, and Fairmont Heights High School, including students with significant cognitive, behavioral, and communication needs in our regional and CRI programs. I stand before you as the FAC chairperson for the Office of Psychological Services, representing 93 school psychologists in PGCPS. I am advocating for the needs of our educators and the students and families we serve. Those in education know we make database decisions and that our opinion without data is just that, an opinion. Therefore, I will be providing you data our FAC has accumulated about the state of psychological services in this county and as it compares to the rest of Maryland. My colleagues had already expressed how what our data looks like in this county, but um, compared to the rest of Maryland, we currently rank 18th out of 24 districts and last among urban districts with more than 50,000 students. Our department is pretty much only staffed for assessment, even though you heard the variety of services we can be providing students, families, and educators. Let's turn to the data of our children. So in 2015, the Maryland Behavior Risk Factor Surveillance System reported that 60% of students in Prince George's County are coping with at least one adverse childhood experience and almost 25% are coping with three or more. This means one out of every four students in Prince George's County is in survival mode and at a high risk for social, emotional, and cognitive impairments. Additionally, since July 1st, 2018, our crisis team has responded to 22 events of staff or student loss. As a member of one of those school communities, I can speak from experience about the devastating effect of the loss of a student or staff member can have on a building and the need for continued monitoring for the effects of grief on the community at large and those greatly impacted by the loss. Lastly, since July 1st, 2018, professional school counselors and school psychologists have logged 111 suicide interventions for students kindergarten through 12th grade. That is 111 of our children in such extreme distress that they are considering ending their lives and should have increased access to student and psychological services. The most important skill I have as a psychologist is empathic listening to staff, students, and families. I often have to reduce the amount of time I have to speak with educators, families, and our amazing students because it, there are too many fires I have to put out in my buildings and remain in compliance with my evaluations. My ratio of 1,851 students greatly reduces my ability to practice the most simple and powerful skill I possess as a professional, and I am personally struggling with picking which child in which case gets my time today and which fire will continue to burn to the next week I'm in the building. 
In light of the data, the Office of Psychological Services is requesting that you support the PCPS Board of Education proposed budget in its entirety, including the mental health amendment for hiring more school psychologists and social workers. Significant increases in staffing for psychological services will better support our children's social, emotional, and behavioral needs and ultimately their academic success. It takes courageous decisions to spark change and our children can no longer wait. Thank you. Ruthie Mundell and then it's be Sinatra Smith. Um, I'm Ruthie Mundell. I'm here on behalf of uh, Nancy Meyer and all the rest of my colleagues at Community Forklift. We are a nonprofit reuse center. Uh, we pick up donations of building materials, renovation supplies, and even entire houses throughout the DC region. You can picture a Home Depot crossed with a Goodwill. Uh, and then we make these materials available to the public at our warehouse in Edmonston at up to 90% below retail prices and distribute free materials to nonprofit schools and neighbors in need. We're primarily self-funded through sales at our thrift store, but in recent years we've been very grateful to receive some funding from the county and we are hoping it will continue. It's a great investment for Prince George's County because we are creating real grassroots economic development from the ground up. Since we opened in 2005, we've kept $30 million of perfectly good building materials from going to local landfills, instead making those supplies available and repairs more affordable for tens of thousands of county residents. When we make it more affordable for homeowners and business owners to keep their properties in good repair, our communities are cleaner and safer. If they can afford to improve their homes, it means they're less likely to lose their homes to the bank and they're hiring more of our local tradespeople to do those repairs. Uh, also, we're delighted to report that we've created almost 50 green jobs with benefits at our operation, as well as training and career opportunities for returning citizens. A fourth of our staffers are folks who face barriers to employment before joining us, and many of them are now in management positions. <clears throat> We also serve as an accelerator for local nonprofits and small businesses. We're a reuse incubator for a sustainable environment. Uh, we've had several businesses grow, and our biggest success story is Tanglewood Works, a business that has moved over to Hyattsville. She outgrew us, and she now um, employs 30 artists part-time. Um, we also have provided $400,000 in free materials to neighbors in need and $60,000 a year to local nonprofits. Everything from community gardens and uh, buddy benches in our schools to furniture for local nonprofit offices. So through our operation, we're bringing valuable resources into Prince George's County. The majority of our materials are donated from outside the county in wealthy areas like Potomac, McLean, and Annapolis. Um, and we're also attracting regional tourism as folks come from all over the mid-Atlantic to shop for antiques. So, oh, and we've also brought significant media attention to the county, uh, attracting over 300 stories on local and national press over the last decade. So to summarize, building materials reuse is great for our world and our county's wallet, uh, but right now we regularly have to turn down offers of great materials because we don't have the sp staff or space to handle it. We need more trucks, we need a more accessible facility for the seniors, veterans, and disabled clients we serve. Uh, investing in a community forklift and our unique social service and nonprofit accelerator operation would have an exponential return for the county. Thank you. Thank you. Sinatra Smith, and then it'll be Patrick Washington. Okay. Uh, Sinatra Smith already went, so uh, I am Patrick Washington. Um, I wear many, many hats as a lifelong county resident. Uh, I've worked as an emergency dispatcher for Prince George's County for the past 29 years. I've counted, I have 208 days left. Some of you may recognize me as the poet. Uh, I'm usually performing at some function or another. Others know me as the executive director of the Prince George's County Youth Poet Laureate Program, which fosters civic and community engagement through the arts. Now in its fourth year. Today, I stand here as a teaching artist. We are the unsung heroes when it comes to education. For the past 12 years, I've worked as a TA for multiple organizations, both local and national. As a proud MFA from the U Street School of Hard Knocks, my primary focus has always been spoken word, poetry, and creative writing, usually delivered through the lens of hip hop. I like to call myself a spoken word mercenary. I've been with every organization you can imagine, and I can say that there are few as consistent 
or as important as the Prince George's African American Museum and Cultural Center. I spent the past five years traveling this county visiting elementary, middle, and high school classrooms, and I've never walked out with students the same way I found them. The programming that emerges from the museum leaves students enlightened, challenged, and considerate of their community. Not even a few hours ago, I was at um, William Wirt Middle School in Riverdale. I was showing young people photographs and artifacts of our county's first four black townships. I left students there today wondering where Eagle Harbor exactly was and what elements can help make a community stronger. I created some leaders today. In short, this is transformative work, but it's not magic. So these uh, teaching artists need your help. Our administrative staff at the museum, Monica Montgomery, Dr. Smith, and other teaching artists like myself, we go above and beyond to reach the citizens of this county. And with your help, we can expand that reach. Thank you. Thank you. Carol Bias. And after Carol, be Daryl Carrington. Good evening. My name is Carol Bazes, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. And for the past eight years, I've provided counseling services through the Prince George's School Mental Health Initiative. The initiative is a partnership that was formed between the National Center for School Mental Health the University of Maryland and Prince George's County Public Schools and the Maryland State Department of Education. I'm here to request the approval for the additional funding for school psychologists and mental health professionals. The primary pur purpose of my position is to provide mental health services to students who are in the transition program located at Northwestern High School. This is a special education program for students who have emotional disabilities. A major component of our work is to maintain students in the public school setting. Students that I work with have behavior, academic, and emotional challenges. Historically, the transition students receive counseling services from me and our school psychologist. This year, however, students have, been given the same, have not been given the same degree of services due to the fact that our school psychologist has responsibilities in other schools two days a week. In addition, she is part of the IEP meetings, and so the three, two out of the three days that she is in our school, she's in meetings all day. This has severely affected the level of service that not only the transition students or special ed students receive, but also the general population of students. The National Center for School Mental Health studied the impact of school mental health, and here are some of their findings. As school mental health programs have significantly greater access to children and adolescents relative to the community mental health centers, it is critical to provide mental health care in schools. School mental health programs have a positive impact across a variety of emotional, behavioral, and educational outcomes. For example, studies show improvements in behavioral and emotional symptoms, increases in social competency, increases in standardized reading and math tests, improvements in commitment to school, increases in school attendance, increases in grade point average, improvement to services access, to access utilization and services for ethnic minority youth. Some of the students that I've interacted with in the last week outside of my normal counseling caseload have come to me, one student shaking uncontrollably in a counselor's office, another student with chronic anxiety exhibiting symptoms of a panic attack, a student crying because her father passed away and no one has been there to console her and this just happened this month, a student had a fight with her boyfriend and has suicidal thoughts, a student witnessed another student in a very serious accident. These these are the students that sought help that I'm aware of just this week. What about the students who are struggling silently? Those who are bullied, who question their sexual identity, are stigmatized, who fear deportation, suffer from depression or anxiety. We need more school psychologists and social workers to help the students achieve success. Thank you.
Thank you. Daryl Carrington. Daryl. Andre Thomas. Andre. Millicent Hawkins. Millicent Hawkins. Paul Rowe. And after Paul, we'll have Grace Williams. Good evening, County Executive Officer Brooks. Uh, for the record, my name is Paul Rowe. Um, I'm a 17 year resident uh, here in the county, and I'm testifying this evening in my role as the chair of the Housing Authority of Prince George's County. And uh, in that role, I had the opportunity to serve on the Comprehensive Housing Strategy um, Advisory Committee. And as you know, that um, Comprehensive uh, Housing Strategy, or the CHS, was commissioned in 2016 by the council. And the purpose behind that was to establish a roadmap, if you will, uh, for housing investments here in the county for the next 10 years. Now, the Housing Authority Board Commissioners uh, in January uh, passed a resolution endorsing the comprehensive housing strategy, but going further and supporting one of its recommendations, which is the annual funding uh, for a local rental assistance program here in the county. So what does that, what does that mean? For well, purposes of this meeting, it means 5.9 million requests uh, annually uh, for a local rental assistance program. Now, um, let's discuss the need, and that need is well documented in the CHS. For example, 41% of county households are considered housing cost burden. That means that um, their housing costs exceed 30% of their annual income. And uh, another statistic is that 49%, uh, one out of two households here in the county, uh, renters uh, in the county uh, are housing cost burden. Now, we see this every day um, at the Housing Authority. We serve the housing needs in our public housing program 376 households, 70% of them are seniors and, um, and the disabled, the most vulnerable uh, in our community, the most uh, hard to house, as we say. Um, we also serve another 5,800 households through our Housing Choice Voucher Program. Now, we have a waiting list of 7,200 7, households, and that really belies the true need. Uh, when we opened up our waiting list uh, two years ago, uh, there were 40,000 applicants, and we had to cut off the waiting list at 9,000 in order to manage that. Now, the solution that we came up with in terms of the local rental housing assistance program is um, uh, there's precedent for that. Um, uh, the um, Montgomery County, the District of Columbia, and Arlington County all have local, locally funded rental assistance programs. So again, uh, we'd just like to uh, know that with that money, we would service 400 households, uh, specifically those that are most vulnerable, uh, namely seniors and uh, the disabled. I will get you a formal request before the end of the week, as I also promised to the council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Grace Williams, and after Grace, it will be Margaret Bowles. Good evening, County Executive. For the record, I'm Grace Williams. I'm a, a resident of Prince George's County for the past 30 years. And I'm a mother of uh, two I mean, twin adult daughters with intellectual and developmental disabilities, autism, and other special health care needs. I'm also a member of the ARC of Prince George's County and a founder member of the ADCAC, Adults with Developmental Disabilities Citizens Advisory Committee. And I'm here to appeal for the, the supplemental money for the minimum wage gap. The quality of my children's lives depend on like nonprofit organizations like the ARC and the services and the direct support professionals. And this minimum wage supplement income that, that we are asking, that the supplement that we're asking is about 3.5 million in order to meet the needs of the uh, direct support professionals. Um, we, I face this on a daily basis 
the lack of staff, the quality of staff, to retain the staff, because there are nearby counties and District of Columbia where there's more commitment for this money. Our the direct pro support professional's job is not a minimum wage job like in a um, McDonald's or a typical um, industry. They need special training. They have to be uh, trained in both first aid medic medicine to give medicines and also other behavioral supports like my daughters have um, behavior plans that they have to be implemented. So it's a specialized service and this service, this money is very important for the quality of life. And the other, uh, yeah, like our ad tech chair um, asked us about the office for people with disabilities. For example, the hospital, the, the Prince George's County Hospital, uh, we have asked to have special plans in place for to serve people with developmental, intellectual, and other disabilities. For example, the dental program. Our children and adults have to travel distance, Baltimore, uh, like University of Maryland Dental Clinic, and there are not enough providers who have specialized to serve this population, and also specialty, specialty care like the neurologist, the gynecologist, um, the psychiatrist. We, are, we, have to, we, we don't have those facilities, so if we have an office for people with disabilities, they can be at the table to make sure we have this in place when our hospital is built. And I once again appeal for the supplemental funding of $3.5 million for the quality of life and to have an office for people with disabilities. Thank you. Margaret Bowles, and after Margaret will be Isaias Portel. County Executive also broke. I'm Margaret Bowles, and I live in Mitchellville. I've taught school here for 30 years. For the past five years, I've tutored ESOL high school students to try and help them understand English better and speak it better. I see how hard the teachers and the students and the counselors struggle for success. We have 47,000 international students in our school, 44% of our students. many of whom do not have English as their first language, most of whom do not have parents who speak English. We have not addressed this opportunity as anything but a problem. It is not a problem. It is our reality. We can work with it to enlarge our vision, become more worldly, more wise, more aware of all the cultures that are the wealth of our county. If we look at it realistically, we will put in the budget in the planning and in our policies, the work and the money needed to hire more bilingual teachers, secretaries, counselors, and social workers, actively incorporate bilingual parents into our volunteer programs. We will look carefully at areas where there are food deserts, shortages of medical care professionals, and overcrowded schools so that we can address the issues of great inequity. The Transforming Neighborhood initiatives were a very good idea because they work to address some of the most neglected areas in our county. We must continue to enlarge that work by hiring trauma-informed bilingual counselors, especially in middle and high schools, by hiring bilingual conflict resolution specialists in all three area offices of the school system. There are none. By training our staffs to recognize and value all cultures and erase the biases that seem to operate that seem to, that they seem to operate under. We are continuing to have economic success in this county, but not all of our children are seeing any care, nor do their families experience economic advantage. Many of our children have experienced great trauma and loss in their lives. No one is addressing this. Our counselors and school psychologists need to be properly trained to address these traumas. And I have been ensured by the counselors that they have that training, that they can give to the counselors, but they, are not, they don't have the time to do it. They need time allotted to hold group counseling sessions for middle and high school students 
so that they can express their concerns because these concerns affect their academic progress, their social success, and their development. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening. I'll just be interpreting for his testimony. Buenas noches. Good evening. Ejecutiva del Condado, gracias por la oportunidad de hablar esta noche. Good evening, County Executive. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Estoy aquí como residente y miembro de Casa Maryland. I'm here as a resident, as a member of Casa. Yo quiero compartir con ustedes algunos retos que enfrentamos los inclinos. I want to share with you some of the challenges that the tenants face. Yo y mis vecinos somos inquilinos en el condado y trabajamos duro para poder cubrir nuestros costos. Me and my neighbors are tenants and we work very hard to try to meet uh, ends meet, to make ends meet. Como todo el mundo. Just like everybody else. Pero la renta sigue subiendo y la calidad de viviendas sigue bajando. However, the rent continues to increase, but the quality of housing is decreasing. Esto no es justo. Yo entiendo que la renta puede subir si las condiciones de los apartamentos mejoran. This is not fair. I understand if the rent increases, but the, the rent increases if the quality of the housing also increases. Pero esto no es el caso. Además, hay gerentes de propiedad que le falta el respeto a inquilinos. However, this is not the case. In addition, there are some property managers that are disrespectful towards tenants. Que de pronto no hablan inglés o sospechan que son indocumentados. Who are disrespectful to tenants who they suspect don't speak English or may be undocumented. Esa falta de respeto termina siendo una discriminación por no hablar inglés. And that lack of respect ends up being uh, discrimination for not being able to speak English. Esto no debería pasar. Necesitamos una estrategia que incluya soluciones para estos y otros retos que enfrentan los inquilinos. And this shouldn't be happening. We need a strategy in order to face these challenges that tenants are facing. Yo sé que el condado desarrolló una estrategia de vivienda que incluye los retos que enfrentan los inquilinos y posibles soluciones. And I know that the county has developed a strategy that mentions these challenges that tenants face in addition to possible solutions. Yo apoyo esa estrategia. I support that strategy. Le pido que por favor apoye esa estrategia de vivienda y que se asegure que se contraten suficientes inspectores bilingües de vivienda para mejorar la calidad and I ask that you please also support that strategy and to ensure that you hire enough housing inspectors who are bilingual. De los apartamentos y asegurarse que la población inquilina no vive en condiciones peligrosas. And just to wrap up, uh, to hire more bilingual code enforcement officers to ensure that the housing of the tenants uh, is not a dangerous one. Muchas gracias por la oportunidad de hablar esta noche. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Marvin, excuse me, I know I'm going to mess the name up. Gertrudez. Sorry. And then after Marvin will be Tiffany Norman. Buenas noches. Good evening. Uh, mi nombre es Marvin Gutierrez. Yo vivo en la ciudad de New Carrollton. My name is Marvin Gutierrez and I live in New Carrollton. Uh, vengo representando, vengo con representantes de Casa de Maryland. I am a member of Casa. Uh, hoy me quiero enfocar en el tema de seguridad pública y la relación entre la policía y la comunidad. Uh, I want to focus today on public safety and the relation between relationship between the police and the community. Yo como mucha de la gente quiero vivir en en un lugar don, donde yo y mi familia podamos vivir seguro. Um, me, uh, me like, uh, I want to live in a place where uh, I feel safe, just like everybody else. Y un factor clave se, se, en sentirse seguro es tener una buena relación con los agentes de la policía. And one key factor of feeling safe is having a good relationship with police officers. 
y tener confianza and have uh, trust in them y yo creo que es necesario que financiar y apoyar programas que se enfoquen en construir confianza con agentes de la policía and i believe it's important to fund programs that help build that relationship between the community and the police se necesita conectar a la comunidad y los policías en situaciones y eventos de amistad we need to connect the community with police officers in situations that are friendly and non-enforcement. And that way, community members can meet their police officers who patrol their community. In March of 2018, I heard an accident in front of my house. Y salí a tratar de ayudar y vi que la persona que causó el accidente estaba abandonando el accidente. And I went to go check it out and I noticed that the person who was involved in that car accident was fleeing the scene. Yo empecé a seguirlo y en un corto tiempo la policía se equivocó de persona. Creyeron que yo era la persona que manejaba el vehículo. So I began to follow the individual and shortly after the police officers confused me with the the person driving the vehicle that caused the accident. En ese momento me dijeron que me detuviera. Yo me detuve, pero el policía empezó a golpearme. Uh, they told me to stop, and I stopped, and at that moment, the police officer began to hit me. Muy fuerte, incluso llamaron, llamaron a migración. Uh, they hit me hard, and in fact, they called immigration. Pero en el momento se dieron cuenta que yo no era el culpable de ese tipo de problema. And shortly after they realized that I was not the, the person at fault. Uh, por, ese, por eso mismo la comunidad tiene miedo por poder uh, participar con la policía. Uh, and for stories like these, uh, folks are scared sometimes to interact with police. Esto sucedió con la policía de New Carrington. Uh, this happened with New Kelton Police. Para terminar, para terminar, cualquiera de nosotros nos podemos encontrar en la situación difícil y necesitamos la ayuda de la policía. And to wrap up, any of us can find ourselves in a situation where we can need the help of police officers. And that is why uh, I support funding programs that help build that relationship. Gracias. Thank you. Oh, Thank you so much. I just want to make sure someone connects with him so I can get more information about the situation we've described. And I thank you for coming out tonight and having the courage to share your experience. Can somebody, Antoinette will meet right there, if you can get, can you help him to get, to Tiffany Norman, Tiffany, Teresa Dudley. And after Teresa will be Oscar Mardez. I'm working on all this technology I got here, so. My name is Teresa Dudley, and for the record, I'm the president of the Prince George's County Educators Association. And I wanted to bring forth, because I can't get this to work, I'm going to send you it, but I know what I was going to say. One of the things that we are most concerned about is the fact that we are losing teachers. And the impact that this has on the quality of education that our students receive is that when you have new teachers coming in every year, and over the past two years we've lost 15% of our teachers who have gone to Montgomery County, they've gone to DC, other jurisdictions around us. I had one teacher sent me an email and said, Teresa, and she was one of my best volunteers with the union. She said, I have to leave. She said, I can leave and go to Montgomery County and make $22,000 a year, special educator, seven years on the job, $22,000 a year more. And I said, bye, because I can't compete with that. We have to really look at the impact that the, the exodus of teachers out of the system, how it really affects the children. 
And it's, when I say teachers, I don't just mean teachers, I mean educators. Because we're losing school psychologists. We're losing, as a matter of fact, they're contracting out our speech pathologists because they don't compensate them very well. And then we also have our, our school guidance counselors, our occupational therapists. All of these Unit 1 members are leaving. So what do we need to do? A couple of things. One, we need to ex expand the time period that a lot of our teachers, our educators are teaching, are working. For example, our school um, guidance counselors need to be 11 months so that they can do the migration of the children from one grade level to another. The other, um, the PPWs need to be able to work 11, 11 months. Some of them work 12 months out of the year because education doesn't stop because of the summer. We also need to look at how are we structuring our schools. Um, I have had, last year PGCEA worked with the um, school system to establish a community schools policy. And the community schools have six pillars. There's a site coordinator. There's shared um, leadership in the building with the educators. There's wraparound services. There are a lot of, there are six pillars to it. Um, you can go to NEA.org, anybody in the audience who wants to read what they are, and you can see them very easily. The issue is, is if we don't have community schools in place, it's gonna open us up for the Department of Edu craziness that's going on with Betsy DeBoss because what she wants to do is take our Title I money and say, well, you have to put something in place. Community schools is the answer. The TNI initiative started that. I know you're making changes. We need those wraparound services and the money for restorative justice for our, ed for our young people. So I ask you to really look at our, the school system's budget and make sure that our priorities are funded. And thank you for having this event this evening. Thank you. Oscar, and then it'll be Mamie Small. Uh, good evening, uh, County Executive Officer Brooks. Uh, I, uh, too, serve uh, many hats in the uh, Prince George's County. I'm the uh, commander of the largest chapter of Disabled American Veterans here in Prince George's County. And I also uh, serve as president of the Friends of the Oxen Hill Library, and I bring uh, wishes to you from our group. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit group whose purpose is to maintain an association of, pers of persons interested in books and libraries and to encourage youth and young adults to develop that interest, to focus on the public attention on libraries and to stimulate the use of the library's resources and services. Uh, I have been a uh, actively involved with the Friends for over 18 years, and during that time, our group has provided funding to support programs and activities that affect children, teens, young adults, adults, seniors, and members of our community whose diverse cultures look at libraries as their go-to places of learning outside of their homes and schools. We have uh, provided uh, funding for them through grants uh, from uh, our county representatives as well as through donations from folks within the library. Um, uh, some of the things that we've purchased is, if, if I'm not sure if you've been over to the uh, Oxen Hill Library, there's a 70 inch active table panel that we have. We purchased that for them. We purchased uh, uh, computers, a uh, 3D printer and things like that. We do this through donations of funds and we've even had all of the windows tinted uh, so that way they won't, uh, the library books won't deteriorate over time. Um, my uh, question here to you is, uh, let me get back to it. Keep on ticking clock. Okay. Um, uh, what, are, what are your long and short term vision concerning the sustainability of our libraries in this digital age? Uh, and during your administration, do you see yourself uh, continually uh, modest, con uh, continuing modest funding with some increases across the board for all the libraries in the county through a, the appropriation process? And uh, will the, co the county continue its support for keeping the libraries open on Sundays and to aid those in the community who still lack the financial ability to purchase their own computers and internet service? And I thank you for your time today. Thank you. 
Mamie Small, and after Mamie, there'll be Belinda Queen. Good afternoon to everyone. Hi, Angie, how are you? Um, I wear a lot of hats in Prince George's County. I've lived here since, I believe, 1975. Uh, in that period of time, I worked at this school, which is Flower High School, for a while. Uh, before I retired, I um, work with the state delegate and, and, and getting things done for her. And I, I am now here tonight on behalf of my community. My community is Radium Valley Civic Association and I am the president for the last 10 to 15 years. I don't know, I just work. But anyway, uh, one of my main concerns is that we, a few of us, have to take on the responsibility of keeping our community livable, not acceptable. We pay taxes. We have 800 single family homes. We have 11, 1,100 apartments that we, we oversee. And it's not a week that goes by that I don't have to call the county and say, can you come pick up the bulky trash that's been dropped on our street. They have a way of dropping it every night. That's unacceptable to me. That, and then when we call 311, they say, okay, be 45 days before someone can come. Unacceptable, unacceptable. Therefore, I have to get on the phone, call my friends who is in a position and have them to come and pick up that trash. We, don't, we can't have trash bulky trash on our street. And last month, I think it was December, they dropped bulky trash right in front of my community school. The kids had to come in to see that. So again, I have to call my friend to come pick that up, and they do. But one of the things that I wanted to say to you is that we meet every third Thursday at my community school. We put signs out inviting everyone there. Our community now is very, very diverse. We need an after program. We need to have people that do not speak English to enroll in a program. We need funding. So we are willing to work with the students and, and the parents if we had um, some funding for them to come and learn how to speak English, we invite them, we promote unity in our community, we are always doing that, but they don't come. We have a police officer that come to our meetings every single month to, to connect with the people. Thank you very much, police officer. But anyway, that is the main things we want to do is to get a program to educate people. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Can you tell me again, um, what did you say the name of the association is? Radiant Valley Civic Association. We oh, Radiant Valley. Radiant Valley. Okay, we're do you know where we're located? Um, I don't, but you know we're, what? It, we're located from, two, from 202, and we go all the way to 450 in the back of all of these. Okay, and if I could just, Miss Mamie, if Antoinette can get the information, I'll come out. I'd love to come out to your community. I already got you okay. in. I'm already. Oh, well, I'll see you there. <laughs> Belinda Queen. And after Belinda, will be, this will be our last speaker of the night, will be Barbara Solner Weber. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Madam County Executive, for taking the time to come out and listen to us. First, Madam County Executive, let me take the time to thank you for what you have done, what you're currently doing, and what you are going to do to invest in this county. Um, I'm currently elected to represent District 6 School Board and District 3 and 8 Coffee Club, along with the Central Coalition of Prince George's County. So with all of these hats and saying, beautification of our county is so very important. I need your continued support for my public safety officers who work so well with our coffee circles. Um, and, at the, and the citizens of this county, most of us already know who our community police officers are, so I'm asking for your, your continued support of our police department. Along with the education system, you know about the budget, you heard all the things that were asked from the teacher raise, and you've been hearing from the bus drivers, and it's very important. Um, 
I have to say, we're doing a campaign season. A lot of you ran, and one of the most important things, everybody ran on education. Everybody said the school budget was important. Many elected leaders made campaign promises saying that education was going to be very important. Well, my eyes and ears are watching to see who was really for we, the people, and for my babies and putting kids first, and not for me, themselves. If education is important, not only this budget, but continue things for this county will definitely show. And also saying senior and affordable housing is very important in this county. I go to 202 Coalition with Senator Benson and I hear a lot of seniors complaining they can no longer afford to live where they live at and it's hard for them to find affordable houses. People who have worked hard to get this county where they live at do not deserve to be put out or have to go Florida and other places to live with their children. They, be, they need to be able to stay with their friends and be able to afford it. So we need more affordable houses for not only seniors, but you know the salaries the children are making. Even at 30 years old, they cannot afford $1,700 a month because we're not at minimum wages yet. So I'm asking us to work really hard on affordable houses. And last but not most, least, but what's most important, the hospital. We need better hospital service here in Prince George's County. I know University of Maryland is coming, but I don't think it's going to meet all of our needs. Um, they talked about mental health. We've been constantly hearing about mental health. Mental health is so rampant. Back in the days when I was growing up, we had St. Elizabeth, we had Crownsville. Now we just got community. It's all in the midst of our community. So we need more services. We need more hospital. We need more mental health service all over this county. So I'm asking for a mental health service. Um, also, in talking about community schools, it was said earlier, it's so important that we invest not only in libraries, but in our community centers. Um, and we really want to be transparent and support the kids in their home environment so they can not only get a better, a best and quality education, but so they can succeed afterwards. We need to invest in more community centers and more libraries and more after school programs for the kids. So this would also help them be able to succeed because in all honesty, we have a different generation um, you stated earlier, we're not in the 21st century yet. We have a long way to go, but we can push harder to get our kids there. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Thank you. And our last speaker of the night will be Barbara. Hello, County Executive Alsa Brooks. I'm uh, Dr. Barbara Solner Webb, a 47 year proud resident of Prince George's County. Uh, also an emeritus professor at Johns Hopkins University, president of the West Laurel Civic Association. I'd very much like to invite you to come out to one of our meetings. Uh, member of the governor-appointed Patuxent River Commission, uh, Sierra Club Executive Board, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I may be the only speaker tonight who is not asking for funds, but is suggesting how to save money. With 88% of the county's budget going to education and public safety, that leaves only 12% of the budget going to all the other vast number of other important things. And one real biggie is refuse disposal. As everybody knows, a few years ago, the county went from two day to one day a week trash pickup, not only saving the county large amounts of money in not having to run the second uh, trash truck each year, each week, but also um, encouraging recycling. Coincidentally, the county has uh, been ramping up its nascent composting efforts, which uh, reduces trash and supports uh, a more sustainable future. Last year, a pilot residential food scrap uh, pickup program was funded by a grant and allowed collecting of data that will enable food scraps to now be picked up mixed in with yard wastes, which are already being picked up weekly. Now, potentially adding enormous costs to the county refuse start, uh, pickup program has been a promise for a second trash pickup each week. Not only a major financial burden, but also an environmental burden for the county. So my suggestion is yes, go to the promised second refuse pickup each week, but make that second refuse pickup for food scraps and have the residents put their food scraps in with their yard wastes, which are already being picked up weekly. So that would allow for the second weekly refuse pickup at no costs to the county while encouraging sustainable reuse of food scraps by turning them into composts, which indeed are a much desired and saleable product. So please consider this financially prudent and environmentally supportive plan. 
So since that's the last comment of the night with Dr. Webb, I have to tell you, I wish we had you at our table sooner. You'll be so delighted. And our councilwoman is here as well, uh, Councilwoman Ivy. Did you hear that suggestion just now that Dr. Webb said we should do food waste pickup? And you'll be really pleased to know that uh, you'll hear an announcement very soon and it's gonna sound very similar to what you just said. And so, uh, so we'll, we'll you, you, actually, you actually did our announcement for us tonight, uh, is what I should tell you. And so we have, we have listened, we're so excited. We'll soon have a wonderful announcement about food waste pickup, and, and that's our second day of, of trash pickup. Yeah, okay, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, this is the end of our uh, night tonight, and I have to tell you, this has been so helpful to me. Um, so I want to thank all of you all for being here tonight. Thank you for taking time uh, to come out and share your concerns. Uh, I assure you that I have heard each of them and taken notes here and um, really just appreciate the opportunity to have shared a bit with you about our uh, budget priorities and to have heard from you as well. So I appreciate it and, uh, and look forward to more opportunities to hear from you in this way. Um, so thank you so very much. We'll pass these concerns uh, along. We've had Stanley here. We've also had, as again, I've said, uh, Councilwoman Ivy, uh, as we complete this budget soon, I think you'll be very pleased with it. But thank you all so much and, and, and uh, arrive home safely tonight. Thank you.